All right, Gurkhan, it's after lunch. Did you all eat? You're all still awake? No, already we're falling asleep. Oh, well, you got your work cut out for you, man. All right, so here we go. Housekeeping first. You are in ballroom C. This is the anything track. If that's not where you wanted to be, how are you this confused a day and a half into Gurkhan? I don't understand. There was a lot of drinking last night, but they've had energy all day long. I'm like, I'm burned out and they're still going. So that's all right. Very good. You guys are impressive. Second, do not block my fire exits. I have very large people who will summarily remove you from that location if you stand in the doorways. Keep them clear. It's that simple. We've got plenty of chairs for everybody. Come on in, sit on down or don't. Just don't stand in my doorways. Last, the cell phones. I hate that I have to say this, but I have to say it. Mute, turn them off, do something with them so that they do not make noise. If you're going to browse Facebook, Twitter, and you're looking at videos, be aware they're going to make noise. So don't do it. You should be paying attention because this is going to be a killer presentation. All right? You're all with me? All right, they're awake. That's good. All right. So our next speaker is going to talk to you all about those threats that we all face. How many of you travel for a living? Awesome. Ever think about all those public places we end up in and all the threats from a security perspective? Well, our next speaker is going to talk to you all about it. Here you guys go. It's Len. What is up, Gurkhan? First of all, just a quick thank you to the, the organizers and everything. This is kind of like coming home, but I wish y'all would have scheduled this when it was a little bit warmer. See, I, originally I'm from West Side Detroit, but I was one of the smart ones. I moved out of here about six years ago, and I live in Texas now. So getting off the plane to 40 degrees, y'all, I'm sure, still think this is like spring. I kind of remember what it used to be like, but it's a little cold once your blood thins. So thank you very much for coming to today's session. I am one of those people that travel very, very extensively. And what, what today's talk is all about is for the people that actually maybe like me, maybe you're not an extensive traveler, maybe you're a business traveler, but you wind up in hotels, conference centers, even things like this. You know, I've got a couple of things that we're going to talk about, but basically, are you dealing with an Airbnb or are you dealing with an Air C&C? So a little bit, there's some information about me. If you want to get with me after the fact, go ahead. I also, for the, in case you hadn't figured it out from my email, I am one of the uh, white hats that works for CyberArk Security Software. So if you want to have, have any questions, you can meet me over at the booth after the fact. Uh, I'm a firm believer in the fact that it, why should you say something if somebody else has already said it better? And I'm a very, very firm believer in Sun Tzu and the art of war and the fact that most of the things that you read in that book are just as applicable to cyber warfare as it is to physical warfare. And this line right here, if the enemy leaves the door open, you must rush in. That's pretty much every hacker's basic mantra. I mean, realistically, we are a bunch of really opportunistic people. So as long as you keep that in mind, it's a great starting point for any type of security and or attack methodology. So today, these are basically the attacks we're going to look at. And some of these you may have seen before. But the whole point behind this talk is the fact that most of us are in some type of a corporate or environmental env or environment where we have a lot of additional security protocols in place. We've got AI. We've got uh, IDS systems. We have all of this stuff that we have within our corporate environments that we all take for granted that the minute we step out of those doors and we go out into the wild, we're in that wild that we always talk about. You know, we always hear about code being released to the wild. You know, and it's very, some, you know, metaphoric, but for the traveling user, we're living in that environment between airports, hotels, coffee shops, conference centers. You know, how many times are we looking into utilizing some type of a free Wi-Fi? Does everybody here have their own MiFi access point? Do you have a hotspot? If you're using those free Wi-Fis, are you using a VPN with them? You know, or at some point, do you get off the plane at 1130 at night after being on a 12-hour flight? You just need to check your email and do you just go, you know what, I'll be okay just this one time. So we're going to show how mouse jacking, this is a very old vulnerability, but I see it more times than not where if I'm sitting in these hotels, 
How many times have you walked out of your house if you have one of those vulnerable mice dongles that you just leave the mouse, but it's plugged into the back of your laptop and you just forget that it's even there? The mouse isn't the vulnerable piece of hardware. The dongle is. Hotel keys, RFIDs. I'm gonna sh we're going to sit and I'm going to show you how, we're gonna, how easy it is to clone an RFID card, and that opens up the door for an evil maid attack. And if you're not familiar with that, that's your physical hands-on if you got a Linux host or if you got a Windows or a Macintosh computer, if I can get my hands physically on the box, it's a simple key combination to boot it into a recovery. QR jacking. We haven't seen this much here in the States yet, but I do a lot of international travel. I mean, I just got back from uh, Chile last week. But I'm seeing a lot more over in Europe where we're not seeing com the captive portals for hotels as much anymore. On the little envelope where you get your key card, they're giving you a QR code that's actually setting up the Wi-Fi for you. Trust me, I have my own hotspot. I'm not using it. But this is the methodology that they're going to. So that led me to start thinking about what happens if I decide to put out my own cards. And to be honest, I've actually dropped a few things, and I'm wondering if anybody here at this conference has actually fallen victim to me. Yeah, well, you're going to see what I dropped around the con here and if, when we get down into that attack, but I've dropped QR codes that say Gurkhan 2019 Wi-Fi access. It, I, I'm not doing anything bad. All it does is just basically hit a hit counter. But the realistic question is, this is a security conference, and I'm willing to bet I, I dropped 25 of these cards. I'd be willing to bet I got two or three. Guaranteed. Uh, Pi RDP is a rather new script that's actually been, I've discovered that works really, really well, especially if we combine that with that QR jacking in the Z proxy. Because at that point, I have the ability, I can start playing with your DNS information, I can start playing with your ARP information, and I can basically set up an RDP man in the middle that I can stream, record, take over your RDP sessions, and set up a full keyboard trapper. I know this doesn't really seem like it would be much of a mobile style attack, but when you, like I said, when you combine that to the fact that realistically in this room, I would probably be willing to bet that at least somebody has had a call from work about some kind of a problem that they've had to log into work and address an issue from this conference. All I have to be is in the right place at the right time and have you filtering through my equipment and I can actually steal every single thing within your RDP sessions. And finally, WHID Cactus. So I've already talked to some, one person here at the show this, this last couple of days who's heard of this, but this is something that's still relatively new as far as an attack, piece of attack hardware. It's only with two and a half, three years old total. It's the same concept as your USB rubber duckies, your bad USBs, any type of command injection, but the difference is, is it's not going to deliver that payload the minute I plug it in. It's got a built-in ESP8266 web development board with its own AP and its own web-driven attack framework. So now, if I'm sitting somewhere, I actually have the ability to plug something, this device, into the back of a kiosk system. I can go sit over on the other side of the bar, and I can access pretty much the whole hotel's network because they don't understand how these things are working and they're plugging them directly into the same internet that they're using for their point of sale service and the rest of their their network. So let's go ahead and let's start taking a look at it. Mouse jacking, if you're not familiar with this particular term, this is a series of attacks that's centered around the, the Wi-Fi wireless mice, keyboards, and trackballs. These are vulnerable at a hardware level. The little wireless dongle that gets plugged in, I want to say it's over 82% of those dongles are will transmit and receive in both secure and insecure modes out of the factory. There's a secure channel between the device that comes paired with it, but all you need is something like this down here in the corner. This little guy down here, yeah, I know, pretty cool presenter's mouse, isn't it? <laughs> Only the geeks have the cool toys. But this is a $35 antenna that you can purchase off of Amazon that is originally intended for use with do-it-yourself drones and quadcopters. But the chip on it is able to be flashed so it will listen on the same frequency as those wireless mice and, and trackballs and keyboards. So what do these 
types of devices interface to the computer as? HID. So it's not going to stop it. All I have to do at that point is scan for any of those vulnerable pieces of hardware, and I can use a secondary script called Jacket, which allows me to take any existing USB rubber ducky script and weaponize that connection. So this is the basic background on what the mouse jacking attack is, but let's take it into the mobile threat. Excuse me. Like I said, it's cold here. I've been in Michigan for two days, and I'm getting a, getting a cold already. So let's take a look at the, a different scenario. So we've already basically asked how many people here are actually out traveling and doing a lot of mobile type work. So we're all smart in here. We're all here at GERCON. We're all security oriented. So that means we're all going to be connecting back into our, our corporate environments through some type of a VPN, right? Right? Yeah? Yeah. Well, what about the fact that since I'm basically taking advantage of a, a human interface device, if you're connected to your VPN sitting in the hotel lobby and you have one of these vulnerable devices, I am VPN'd into your network. I have the ability to take advantage of any of the current existing connections that you have. So we're going to walk through this. Now, let me go back. I like to set this up real quick. I am a completely transparent presenter. If you guys think I'm pulling the wool over your eyes or you're trying to think I'm trying to blow some sunshine up your butt, call me out. Straight up call me out. All I want to point out here is you'll see I'm using a piece of software called Virtual Here. It's just a USB share program because anybody here wants to tell me that USB pass through for VMware is great. We can take that offline and I'll have, we can have the longest discussion you want as soon as this is over. So all I'm doing is just pointing out and proving the fact that my vulnerable mouse, you can see, is actually the mouse jack antenna is connected to my Kali host. And if we look over here, we'll see that my vulnerable mouse is actually in use by the Windows system. So let's go ahead and I'll let me let it run. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to use a script that's actually going to launch a Mimi Cats attack based on a process hollowing. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create some noise over there on the Windows box, and we're going to fire off the listener antenna. So he's just over there working around, doing his normal daily life, and very quickly we're going to see the, the hardware address of that vulnerable transmitter pop up over on the Cali side. There it is. So at this point, all I'm going to do is I'm going to use existing USB rubber ducky scripts and ones that I've created myself. And we're going to send the payload over through that mouse port. Now, normally the, these windows would be completely obfuscated, but I want you guys to see what the hell is going on. So the first thing it does is it ele elevates itself into an administrative PowerShell, and we're going to be doing a process hollowing attack. So I'm going to download some files, and before anybody wants to go there, yes, this is another reason why you don't want to have administrative rights on your local endpoints. Because if you do, it allows me to download a nice little tool called Start Suspended, at which point I can start a calculator process in a suspended state. Then I download a DLL that I've compiled that has Mimikatz in it, attach my DLL to the, the suspended calculator process, and then re release the entire thread to the processor. The only thing your system, your antivirus, or, or anything is going to see is that calc process. <laughs> And in return, it's going to email all of the contents back to me, and there's the complete Mimikads log dump. This is just one example of something that can be done through the mouse jacking-based attack. Think about what could happen if I decided that to do some type of an, a full UDP scan against your entire network. If you're remotely VPN'd in, I can actually effectively target and map your entire corporate environment, even though I'm sitting across the room from you. I like to tip, I'm not going to talk a lot about mitigations and remediations, but the one thing I will say in regards to mouse jacking attacks, don't use vulnerable hardware. You know, and the truth is, if you want to talk about Bluetooth, this is a hacking con. Bluetooth has its own inherent issues. They're not as necessarily as easy to weaponize, but they have their issues too. If you really want to be safe, I'm not going to say be like Mike, but you could be like Len. I use wired mice. I use a wired keyboard. There's no way you're going to get to that unless you get an inline piece of hardware into my system. Don't make it easy for the bad guys. Like I said with my original quote, if the enemy's going to leave a door open, an attacker will rush through. 
Proxmarks, these are one of the most fun toys you can actually get. So let's talk about what the scenario for the mobile attack is. You've got something like this. There's a, probably a lot of very intelligent, important people at your all individual companies here. Nobody wants to carry their, their laptops and all of their stuff around all day if they don't have to. All I have to do is a little quick social engineering to follow you with my Proxmark in my pocket. I can actually clone your potential, potentially clone as long as, as it's RFID. I can clone your key card for your hotel room, wait for you to go in there, drop off your computer so you can head out to go have drinks, tear it up last night. Maybe you went to the hacker newlywed game. You never know. But you're leaving that information, your data unguarded in your room with the thought that it's safe. There's a lot of, been a lot of talk about evil made attacks. Evil made attacks are the, the attacks that of physical access to your device without your knowledge. Happens in hotels all the time. And it's this easy to do. So I turn on my Proxmark, connect, turn on the antenna, and we're just going to start looking around for anything that happens to be in range. Keep in mind, I can't do this in real life because I'm not really down for the state-run long-term vacations anymore. I'm getting a little bit old, and it's just not really my thing. But as you can see, if we do a simple scan, we see that we found one tag right here. So with a very simple execution, we can say, "Give me, start giving me the, the publicly available access information. So if I do a uh, low, high frequency scan, turn around, let it play out, it's going to take it a couple of seconds, but it's going to return all of this, the, the superfluous, superfluous random data that is contained within those tags. Boom. So right off the bat, you notice that we have on each channel, we are missing two key pieces of information. Without these, I can't copy this, I can't clone this. So at this point, all we have to do is change the query and go more of a targeted attack on both channels looking for those two specific keys in, on both uh, bank A and B. And it'll very quickly return those to me. I just have to impersonate the receiver that would actually be requesting those. So just like that. It's enumerating each one of the segments. Gives it just a second. And one more moment, guys. There it is. So now we're able to gain the, the two missing pieces of data. At this point, all we have to do is go back to the original scan and request for the, UI, the UUID of the actual transmission. Once we get that, we can come over here. Sorry, it's moving a little bit too fast. And it'll actually turn around and take all of that information and rewrite it back down to any blank RFID card that I have available. This one's a little bit hard to show, but the moral behind trying to show this to you guys is the entire process takes less than four minutes. Sir. De the range is dependent upon the power of the antenna that you're using. Because I actually have a secondary pack with additional battery, which will allow me to push a much higher dB antenna. Uh, you could get away. I've had no problems with six feet, eight feet, no problems. With, by default, without the higher powered antennas, yeah. You do have to maintain con proximity depending on how long and how many bytes and how, how many keys are in the cards. You do have to be there for, like this one here was approximately 15 to 25 seconds. Yeah, crowd, long running crowded elevator, very, very easy. So, sir. Um, you would probably need to find some additional tool 
uh, you could probably use a Raspberry Pi, a Tinkerboard, something along those lines that you can run off of a battery pack, but you would need something that you could try and set up some type of automation software with. I'm sorry, say that first part again. Yeah, essentially, yeah. You know, if you, it does become a little bit more difficult, and that's why even with the scenario that I was explaining, trying to find that one person that you can potentially social engineer to be standing close to them long enough to be able to read the data and get what you need, it does take a little bit of social engineering. It's not as simple as just walking by somebody and standing there for two minutes. So this is definitely something to be concerned about. There, if you check out the Hacker News and a lot of the security blogs, you will see that evil made attacks have been on the rise, especially in Europe, and we're starting to see them more in some of the major cities here in the U.S. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I personally find conferences like this to be one of the greatest social engineering attack zones because everybody here wants to learn. So if you're, if you know that, it's not hard to turn around and take that same desire to try and gain knowledge and use it as a manipulation tool to gain knowledge in an adverse way. <laughs> no, it does not. RFID will not go through aluminum foil or lead or anything else. The truth of the matter is, is we are vulnerable every time we walk out of our house. Did, did you have a question, sir? No, okay. So, this is something that is a little bit on the new side. Like I said, I do a lot of traveling in Eastern Europe. I've traveled to the Middle East. I've traveled to South America. I'm, we're seeing, I've seen more and more in some of the European countries where they're no longer using captive portals. They're basically handing you a QR code that will configure the Wi-Fi access, put in the password for you, and give you access to their systems. They're printing them directly on the little piece of you know, cardboard that they put your little plastic card key in. Well, this to me is just bad idea waiting to happen because what happens if you're somebody like me and you drop 25 of these around the conference? I've dropped 25 business cards that look like that around this conference over the, the course of the last day and a half. This is not going to do anything, but if you actually say yes, it's going to hit one of my web servers and it's going to just put a little hit counter out there that says, you know, somebody connected. I'm not doing anything to you aside from just seeing whether or not I, you were smart enough not to click that link. And to be honest, I've been on calls all morning, so I don't have the, re the results. But if you want to check back at the CyberArk booth, I will be checking the results as soon as I get off stage here. But this is the same kind of thing. So let's talk about our attack scenario. What happens if we're somewhere hotel? Conference. It's not hard. Take a look here. Anybody think, does that look like the official logo? Kind of fits the same fonts. Same everything. So I'd like to think that nobody clicked on these, but like I said, out of 25, I'm, I'm betting on two or three. I'm betting on two or three. We'll see afterwards. But what happens if you're in a situation where, like, hypothetically, what if I instead of pointing you at just a standard access point, what if I pointed you at an access point that was actually a zap proxy? At that point, I have the ability to filter pretty much every single thing that's going through. So just to give you a quick overview, so we're going to set it up here. This is basically how you would set up the QR portion of the setup. I actually had to go look this up because I'm like, first of all, why would anybody want to set up Wi-Fi through a QR? And then why would anybody be stupid enough to actually scan it? So 
as we go through, we're just going to create a little access point. And once you get, this is just a straight up JavaScript QR generator that is embedding all of the standard information that we would normally expect to be putting into some type of a, an SSID based Wi-Fi connection. We can set it to WAPA2, none, give it a nice little password. Um, just show that we are connected, get the properties. Make sure everything lines up. I, like I said, I try to be as transparent with everything that I'm doing as possible. Anybody in the, can do this. Most people are not going to show you what goes on behind under the hood. My point is that I want you to leave here more educated than you were when you came in. So at this point, all we have to do is say generate. And we have a, a QR code that when properly scanned, will actually configure the entire Wi-Fi setup on a cell phone or a tablet for you. And this is what we are seeing more and more as a, a preferred methodology coming out of Europe. Yeah, forgive me, I, I didn't get a, the best chance to edit my video, so it d d t did take it in just a second, but you see it was that fast. All they had to do was say yes. And if you take for granted that whatever you're scanning and the same thing could be said in terms of captive portals as well. Utilizing things like the social engineering toolkit, black eye, you know, a lot of the different social engineering scripts, just because it looks like the Hilton or Marriott's captive portal, are you sure that that's actually what you're logging into? Because once you connect to that, you're potentially passing all of your data through it. Just keep that in mind. So let's see what happens if in a bad situation, you're now connected through somebody like me or you're connected through somebody with nefarious opportunities and means. So at this point, all we have to do is load up the OWASP SAP proxy and we can actually start digging in to every bit of transmission that goes through that connection. Take it a few minutes just to configure everything. If you've never dealt with the Zap proxy, I highly recommend it. It is very powerful and very, very well documented. And if you're trying to actually get a better understanding of the type of traffic, vulnerabilities, and types of things that are going through your network and what your users are potentially doing, this is one of the most well documented and biggest communities out there. So. At this point, we've gone ahead, we've configured everything, we've set it up in terms of our thresholds, output directories. I will be making all of the slide decks available. There's a link for downloads, so if you it is running a little fast and you'd like to slow it down, you will get the opportunity. So at this point, now we can come over here and actually connect as if we were the target user. Again, I don't have a hotel or anything, so I have to try and simulate a lot of this. But if you guys would like to give me a hotel, I'd be happy to take it from you. So at this point, once we start making the initial connections, we can start tearing those transmissions completely apart. We can see all of the active data, active threads. We can actually see any type of uh, active X controls and basically wire this thing down all the way into individual threads that are being utilized and hit from anywhere within the app. So, if you think about it from that aspect, at this point, we can then spider, we can do additional recon, and we can actually tunnel back in the opposite direction. So be aware of what you're connecting to. If you are in a situation where you do have to use hotel-provided Wi-Fi, if you have to use conference-based Wi-Fi, make sure that you get yourself some type of a secondary VPN. Per I'm not trying to say one's better than the other. I personally use private internet access. I've used shadow socks in the past. And if you really are in a position where you don't feel like you have the ability to set up a VPN, there's a really, really great tool out there. If you go to GitHub, it's called Streisand. Yeah, just like Barbara Streisand, I didn't name the thing. But it basically will set up a shadow socks VPN for you within AWS that will run on the free tier. So. It's going to make it better than not. I'm not. If you can do it, get your own connections. But in those situations where you are stuck, 
do everything that you can avoid if possible. You know, I'm not, we all understand that if you're on a job site and you have something to do, you may be in a position where you can't always do the safest, most security conscious processes just because you have to get your job done and you have deliverables. Don't make it easy. Be as, be aware and conscious of the fact that you are not necessarily in your environment. This could be what's sitting on the other end of that. You don't know. Just be aware and try and keep yourselves as safe as humanly possible. I am not, I'm the first person to admit it. They send me all over the world. I am put in situations where I am doing things that I would normally never do. But in order to maintain the, the completion of my deliverables on time, we just have to be as conscious, security conscious as possible and always be aware of the landscape and the fact that, like I said in the beginning, everybody talks about code being released to the wild. The attacks are happening in the wild. As mobile users, we live in the wild. Never forget that. So, any questions on that one? Okay. I know this one, has, people may have seen this, but again, this is one of my favorite attacks. Anybody who hasn't, everybody here familiar with the responder-based attack? Yes? Cool. This is basically responder that when it's running on the actual bash bunny itself, this will actually take hashes out of locked window systems. The time to, to pull this off varies. I've seen it take as long as about three or four minutes and uh, I didn't even modify with the time stamps on this one. For me to actually pull off this one, I think it took less than 60 seconds. Granted, it was a brand new load of windows. It can vary, but the concepts behind it are the same. So again, mobile attack scenario. What happens when you are sitting there you're at the bar, maybe you're with your buddies, just got done with your conference. How long would, how really aware are we when we're just sitting there with our people? I've actually done this before. Granted, it was to a friend of mine, but I've, I pulled out a little digi spark and when we were actually sitting at a coffee, sh like a Starbucks waiting for our planes, and I just slipped it over, plugged in a little digi spark that ran a little, a little bit of a malicious code, just randomly switched his left and right mouse buttons according to some arbitrary algorithm. Just, no, just something to drive him crazy. But what happens if you're not paying attention and somebody can actually slip one of these things into your system? So again, I'm not trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. I'm not hiding anything. Again, we have our attack box here. We have a lock box here. And because of the fact that this is a physical-based attack, I actually recorded the big ugly guy with the beard. So, as we can see, we go in here, we'll, we'll open up the virtual here. You'll see that the virtual mouse is in, still in use by the Windows box. I'm going to set my Bash Bunny to the attack position one, and I'm going to plug it in. Just like any other piece of hardware, computer, it does take a couple of seconds to post up. And in the amount of time that it takes to go from green to yellow, purple is post. It's actually a, running its own version of Debian. Green, green, gold. Solid, hit. I have the hashes. That's all it took. So what happened is that device actually interfaced to the Windows host as a network interface device. It's not coming in as a human uh, HID. It's also not coming in as an SMB. As such, it created a network bridge that was then able to run responder on the device itself and then wait for the system to actually reach out just as part of its normal processes. If I look on the, in the device itself, we'll see that we have a win victim here. And if we open this up, there is going to be all that's every, all the hashes that were pulled out just by the system running applications on it as system. Once we take that, yes, I am using a word list. I have done it without the word list. If you'd like, I have a video. It took it about four and a half hours. But using the word list, I'm able to actually run a short script here just for the purposes of the presentation. We come back with the actual password of CyberArk1 which we can then turn around, open up this, type in the password we were just able to crack, CyberArk1, 
and we can actually gain access to the system. So even locking your computers doesn't necessarily keep you safe anymore. Any questions? So this is the kind of stuff that I'm tr I've been trying to really focus on the fact these are all types of attacks that if we were inside of our corporate networks and we had all of our corporate security in play, these things are not a problem anymore. We've got enough mitigation strategies. We have enough artificial intelligence. We have enough anti-spyware, anti-malware that we've shut this stuff down. And finally, we have two more attacks to go. This one is new. This one is a, a script called PyRDP. Now, what this allows me to do, especially if we build on the earlier attacks of being able to get you to start going through something that I control all of the accesses to, to DNS, gateway, everything else, I can do sit there and listen for connections to an RDP host. All I have to do at that point is just re do some simple redirects. So let's take the, the scenario I gave you guys a few minutes ago. I've dropped those little Gurkhan 2019 Wi-Fi access cards. What happens, you sign up through one of these things, and then you get the phone call from work that says, hey, we need you to log in. All I have to do is get between you and the RDP host. I can sit there and listen for port requests on 3389. If I run the gateway, it's not hard for me to find them. At that point, I do a DNS spoof, modify the host name, redirect you to one of my boxes, and this is the kind of thing that can actually happen now. It, this, keep in mind the quick resolution to this, run TLS. If you're not running TLS over RDP, you will be potentially susceptible to these kinds of attacks. We go in, I point this thing directly at my box, even though you think you're pointing at yours. And you see what's going to happen over on my host. The first thing it's going to do is we're going to actually modify and downgrade the, the RDP version. Then we're going to clone the X11, 511 certificate. And I have a complete recordable and recorded copy of your entire session. He go, you go ahead and you log in. I have a complete keyboard trap. I have the ability to steal everything out of your clipboard. I can even suspend your ability to control the session and I can take it over. So as we can see, here's every single keystroke. Now, let's make it a little bit scarier. So let's say you have this object here and we're just going to copy that and put it into clipboard. I can steal all of your clipboard data. You know, that's a, even that's not really enough. Let's say I want an actual file off of your system. He's going to go, we're going to show that if we yeah, navigate down into the user's pictures directory, photos, see, I say pictures, oh, gosh. Yes, I'm a Mac guy. So all we have to do is pull this up here, and you see we have the psycho-looking cat. Why does everybody love psycho cats? Over here on my, my attack box, I now have access to your entire C drive or any map drives that you are currently connected to. If you have map drives into your network, I have access to those too. All I have to do is right click and I say download and save. I can extricate data right off of your system just like that. All the while, you're not even aware of what I'm doing. But let's take it one st final step more evil. See that button right there that says take control? So what happens if I decide I want to actually do something to you? If I click this take control button, I now am actually in control of your complete RDP session. You just look like you're froze up. And, how, and we all know what, happen, what to do when RDP freezes up, right? Wait. Wait. See if it's actually going to terminate the session, and if it does, we reconnect. If it doesn't, we wait. Once it gives us back control, we continue with our job. So at this point, I've already done what I want to do. So what happens when I decide to relinquish control? See, we're going to go over here first, and I'm actually going to pump up and drop a calculator, just something non-volatile, 10, 10 seconds start, on a calculator process, nothing major. 
But see what happens in my screen and see what happens in your screen. So nothing happens. And the minute I relinquish control, everything will turn around and, and quickly catch back up. And you're still none the wiser. All the entire session is actually recorded in almost a PCAP fashion that I can then turn around and replay at a later, later time as well. So anything I missed the first time, I can come back for later. And finally, any questions on that? Sir. Anybody else? Okay. This little device here is honestly, like I said, it's been around for about a year and a half, two years. This, in my opinion, is one of the most nasty little attack tools that you will ever play with. They are extremely inexpensive. They're only about 15 bucks. These things are, have the ability to do complete keystroke injection. But like I said originally, these come equipped with it a complete ESP8266 web development board on the back of it, and there are multiple different attack frameworks that you can use with this. One of them is called WHID Ninja. I'm a fir I am actually am preferential to one called eSploit. And I've got the a lot of the third-party software compatible with it down there at the bottom. You can check those out if you decide to download the slide deck. So here's the difference. Everybody's seen a Bash Bunny. Everybody's seen a USB rubber ducky. Everybody's seen possibly a bad USB. They all are basically around the exact same concept. It's a command injection. We're taking advantage of the fact that we're plugging into this computer. The computer is interfacing as a human interface device. But at the same time, the issue and the drawback to a lot of these devices is the fact that once you plug them in, the payload is instantly dis delivered. What if we're in a situation where I have a long-running exfiltration job? What if I want to try and do an export of a SQL database table that's going to take hours to complete? Well, anybody here deal with anybody on the C-levels? You know, your CISOs, your CFOs, your CIFOs. Where do they typically want their offices? Up high or on the outside walls? They want those corner offices. They want to have the views of the parking lots. What's another thing about executives? Typically, do they, they have a laptop, but what else do they also have? Large screens and a desktop sitting underneath their desk. All you need is the ability to get into that office long enough, plug this thing in the back of the computer. Works also really well. What was that? thought I heard something. Hmm. But once you plug this thing in, then it's not about that short period of time where, oh my God, he's getting up. He's going to, he's got, I got three minutes. He's running to the bathroom. Let me plug this in and pray that my script finishes before he comes back so I can unplug it. You plug this in. You wait until after hours. You drive up into the parking lot. You connect to that hidden SSID, and you have all the time in the world between the closing time and the next day that you can do whatever you want, and nobody's even going to know you're there. This particular device also has the ability to do full screen captures, mouse control, and it's really inexpensive. 15 bucks. I bought some of these things and gave them away as gifts before at some of my talks. If you're not familiar with a, a site called Tindy.com, great place to find really cool toys. So this is basically the last attack I'm going to be showing you guys today. So again, physical access needed, have to plug it in. So again, you get the ugly guy in the beard up in the corner. We plug it in and basically it's hands off from that point on. You'll see according to my USB share program, the cactus is actually in use by the target. At this point, you'll see we have a, an SSID called exploit. Once I connect to that, this can be connected to from a cell phone, tablet, computer, doesn't matter. We go ahead, we type in 192.168.1.1 
and we actually have a complete framework. The ability to upload code, download code, makes no difference. At this point, it's up to me when that attack happens. It's not a matter of I have a very short window of opportunity that I have to do this and pray that it finishes before somebody gets back and I get caught. So in this case, we can use the WHID Cactus to use the existing connections to the internet to reach out to a, to a payload server, download whatever payloads I want. Again, this is also why you would need endpoint protection. Do not be an administrator on your endpoints and definitely don't leave them logged in. Because if you do, then I guarantee you it's not hard for me to find things like this. So be aware. Be aware of the fact that, yes, we are traveling individuals. We do wind up in situations that we are probably going to be a lot more vulnerable than our in-house counterparts. Sir? Uh, I've actually gotten to about 15 feet through a wall. Uh, to be honest, I, I, I don't know. I haven't tried. But to keep it within the small form factor, I mean, the thing is honestly the size of a standard small USB dongle, uh, SMB. If you, I have one of them actually back over in my bag over at the CyberArk booth. If you'd like, you can stop by. I'll be happy to show it to you. Sir? I've transmitted it through glass, I've transmitted it through drywall, and I've transmitted it through brick. Brick actually is the one that's actually caused me to lose the most degradation of signal, but I was still able to get it on the outside of a building. That's one way you could put it, yeah. You know, it's not, I think... I think the ability for it to be a remote access Trojan is an after fact of the fact that it was originally intended for uh, command and keystroke injection. They just basically started with that functionality and they figured since we're already there, I really don't consider it to be a very good rat because you don't have an actual by streaming ability to see the screen. You can get, have it pop your screenshots and you can maneuver that way, but it is very cumbersome to try and navigate in a live mode a lot easier to just use it as your gateway to be able to to push a reverse TCP shell or something along those lines that would give you the ability, yeah, the ability to have a, a bi-directional communication with the target. Where's the last time the PC going into sleep mode or power state mode? I do have the ability. You can send it wake up signals, yes. As long as the it, it's set to wake on LAN, yes. If not... Uh, there's some things you can try, but it's going to be a 50-50 if it'll be successful. Any other questions? Okay, well, I the slides are available at that URL with that particular password. Uh, please keep in mind those are tiny. If you have never used tiny.cc, it is a case-sensitive URL. So G, the G and the C are capitalized or else you will not find it. Uh, that's basically my presentation for today. Uh, is there any last questions? Yes. It is. Okay. This is, let me finish it by saying this. If that was not a legitimate URL, I, I, we are one of the sponsors here at CyberArk, and this would definitely be a very career-limiting move for me to try and go after you guys here. And I, I love my job. So uh, anything else? Uh, this thing, this is actually a, a Logitech Spotlight, and uh, our, our our new CIFO used this at our, one of our sales conferences about six months ago, and as soon as he, he was done talking, it was like, what is it, where do I buy it, you can get them on Amazon. They're about 80 bucks. Anything else? Uh, it's Bluetooth, so yes, it's inherently vulnerable, but I haven't bothered trying to break it yet. <laughs> All right, well, I thank you guys very much, I really appreciate it, and... Um, Enjoy the rest of the con.